The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Start recording and Khalil, I will take you in. Hi, hi, welcome back everyone. Um, I'm Khalil um, from last time. Uh, this is part two of the Sense Maker in Residence series called Naturalizing Sense Making uh, with Dave Snowden. Um, we all know Dave Snowden for his um, his famous framework called Kinevin Framework. Uh, he's also the founder and chief scientific officer at Cognitive Edge. Um, so, for those who weren't here for the, for the first part of this series. You can find it on the Stoa YouTube channel. And how this is going to work is as usual. Uh, Dave, I think he has something prepared about the Kinevin framework. And then he's, I'm going to hand it over to him. And we can post our questions in the chat. If you have any questions, post them in the chat. If you'd like me to read the questions, um, indicate that when you post the questions. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dave. Dave. OK. I need to um, check something up front. How familiar are people with the Kinevin framework? I, am I giving an advanced presentation or am I giving an introduction from scratch? So if you're, if you're not familiar, would you just wave your hands around so I know how many there are? Okay, right. And that because I'm going to do what I want to try and get done today, and I may only do one of those. Um, is two basic sense-making frameworks. Um, the one which is almost certainly going to get shifted to next time, unless I go really quickly, is called Apex Predator Theory, um, which is a new context-based approach to understanding when you can change things and when you can't change things. I, there, there isn't a universal on that. If I don't do it today, I'll do it next week. Yeah. Um, but I want to focus for the moment on Kinevin, and I want to do it really in two sections. One is a summary of what Kinevin is about. But then I want to develop the new material, which is going to be published shortly in the European Union Handbook on how to manage a crisis, um, which is actually specifically using Kinevin in the context of crisis management. Yeah, and that actually has five separate turns or, or processes you go through. So that's the basic idea. Um, I know when I share the screen, because I'm going to have to use a picture and I can't draw, which is deeply frustrating. I hate slides. Um, but uh, I know when I share the screen, I won't be able to see the chat. So I'm going to try and sort of flip between the two a little bit um, as we actually go on this. OK, so. I'll start off with general and then I'll flip the slides. Uh, Kinevin is a, is a scientific framework. It's, its origins are in physics, chemistry, biology. Um, it's not a social construct. You'll remember from last time I talked about the basic process we've gone through, which is to reject the idea of creating frameworks from case studies and instead take an approach which interacts what we know from natural science with practice and uses natural science as a constraint. So what we actually see in nature is three fundamental types of system, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. Now, now I just want to be very clear now, this is an emerging field. People use language in different ways. Yeah, I, I don't I tend to get hung up on is it really chaotic or do you mean random? I'm going to define my terms as I go. Yeah? Um, and the basic definition I'm using for this comes from Alicia Hirado. And if you haven't read The Dynamics in Action, you should read it. Uh, another new book coming out, thank God, at last um, next year, I think. Yeah? Um, which is the constraint-based definition. So we have ordered systems, complex systems, chaotic systems. Uh, they're defined by constraints. So in an ordered system, the level of the constraints are so high that all behavior can be determined, forecast, and predicted. And so I've got a high level of constraint. I've got predictability. I've got a linear material relationship between cause and effect. 
and I'm using that in the Aristotelian sense of the word. Um, that's actually very valuable. It exists in a lot of human systems. Yeah, it is kind of like good news. Um, but then we get into the other types of systems. So I'm defined as a chaotic system as one which has no material relationship between cause and effect or no effective relationship between cause and effect. I, there are no effective constraints in play, which is kind of like a quasi random state. Everything is without connectivity. Now, what that actually means is it's always a temporary state. Um, as Axelrod famously said, you know, order comes for free. Human beings don't like chaos. Yeah? Um, it's kind of like, you know, somebody will impose constraints pretty damn fast or somebody will create constraints. And part of the problem with a chaotic environment is you may not realize it's chaos and somebody else may impose the constraints and it's too late for you to actually recover. Um, so I'm using chaos in that sense of the word. Other people will actually use it differently. Chaos is an unconstrained state or no effective constraints, which means it's always a temporary space. It's not a permanent space. And then we get comple a complex space. And in a complex space, um, everything is entangled. A concept of entanglement is key. Um, and everything is constrained in all sorts of different ways. We, we normally talk about enabling constraints here. So the connections matter more than the things, something which I'll come back to in the final lecture when I talk about organizational change. Um, trying to change people actually won't work and it's not ethical. Yet yeah, trying to change how they connect, on the other hand, is more effective and I think can be ethical. Right? So the, the connectivity is the key thing in a complex adaptive system. And the whole point about the entanglement and the connections is you can't fully know what they are. You know, the bramble bushes in a thicket metaphor from last time is key. Um, you know, if I pull one bramble, I don't know what the impact will be. All sorts of things can, can do that. That happens at a basic level. I was happily engaged in um, dealing with wet rot and dry rot in garden furniture this afternoon, which involves stringing electrical cables the length of the garden. And shall we just say there was a degree of entanglement both with the electrical cables and also with my language, all right, as we went through that process. So entanglement happens actually very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, so those are three basic types of system. Um, and there are phase shifts between them. Uh, and that's actually important to understand. If you want a metaphor in this, think about solid, liquid and gas. And if you remember from high school, you remember latent heat. So you take water to 100 degrees, it doesn't become steam. You have to put more heat in yet yeah, before it becomes steam. And that's a phase transition or a phase shift. Yeah? Uh, kind of like the mathematics on this backs me up. And so no, Mark, I don't see it as a dyad. I see it as three distinct systems. Yeah? Um, ordered systems, complex systems, chaotic systems. There's an energy gradient between them. And that's really important to understand. So there's a hidden energy cost of transition. Um, and also it works the other way. I mean, my, my children always laugh at me because I'll come in in you know, February or March and say, I can smell snow coming. Um, I grew up in the country, I can smell snow. Uh, they can't. Uh, you know, we're, we're losing a lot of skills on this, right? Um, the reason I can do that is that in order for liquid to become solid, heat has to be thrown out. So it always warms up a little bit before snow comes. And that actually creates a sort of olfactory stimulus, which actually means that if you grow up and you're familiar and you recognize it, you can sort of smell snow coming. Yeah? But the point is energy is given out or energy is required in the process of phase transition. And triggering a phase transition can actually therefore release energy as well as requiring it. Yeah? So that's the kind of like basic three. And you can actually draw Kinevin as a flat plane. Uh, Boasso and I did this at the Academy of Management years ago, in which the boundary between chaos and order is shown as a catastrophic fold. Uh, that's going back to René Tom. Yeah? So basically, if you can imagine a flat plane of paper and you fold the bottom bit over so it looks like a wave, 
that's the boundary between order and chaos. And the danger is you don't notice the cliff until you fall off it. So there's a basic principle here yeah, in terms of the phase transition between order and chaos is a catastrophic transition in, in the way it works. Right? So you know, it, it's the, the straw that breaks the camel's back and, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So if you have a highly ordered system, you're assuming there's constraint and actually constraint is not sustainable. Everything may seem perfectly normal to you, but then one day you wake up and you've fallen off a cliff. Yeah, everything has changed. So that, that, that's shown as a fold. So at its simplest level, Kinevin can be shown as a flat plane with a catastrophic fold at the bottom with those three types of systems. However, um, we move on from that because we're not just concerned with the ontology of the system. We're also concerned with the epistemology and the phenomenology. Yeah, now in human beings, that's quite important because the three are separate. I mean, they're obviously interlinked. What things are, how we know about things and how we perceive things are three separate, separate aspects. And by the way, I'm severely anti-social constructivism. So if we want to have an argument about that later, that's fine. You know, kind of like reality exists, live with it is my general response to that. Um, but the fact is that human perception can differ from human knowledge, can differ from reality. And part of the use of Kinevin is to increase the friction between those three. I'll talk more about that in the final lecture. Yeah? If you can increase the friction between the three, you present the huge misalignments which actually happen. Yeah? I used to give the example of the Catholic Church's misalignment with science at the time of Galileo. The more you misalign, when you have to reset, the reset is catastrophic. Uh, but there are probably better examples in the UK and the US at the moment. I'm not quite sure who I dislike more, Boris or Trump, but they're both out trying to outcompete each other yeah, in populism. So there are other examples. So if you allow a system to become overconstrained, you've got a problem. So one of the things Kinevin does is it basically divides, and at this point, I'm going to go into share screen. Um, I've got to find it now. <laughs> okay, so assuming everybody can see that. Yeah. Um, that's actually the thing I talked about last week. That's the sort of sense making diagram and the different types and I can send the reference to the paper. But coming back to Kinevin, Kinevin effectively has five domains. Um, it doesn't have five quadrants. I worry about people who think there can be five quadrants. It's rather like a former prime minister in Britain who said he wanted all schools to be above average, yeah, which rather showed that his wasn't, he, even though it was eaten. So Canavian has actually five domains. Uh, the chaotic and complex we talked about, but what Canavian does is it splits order into two. Um, one where the relationship between cause and effect is clear and the other where it's complicated. Now the div division here is an important one. In the clear domain, the relationship between cause and effect is self-evident. Everybody buys into it, it's not disputed. Yeah, which means we can all do things the same way. The example I normally give is that civilized countries drive on the left hand side of the road, whereas uncivilized countries drive on the right hand side of the road. You know, kind of like it's a simple bifurcation. Where am I? It's a classification system. Where am I? What type of country is it? Which side of the road I should drive and then go with it? Yeah. Sidebar on that, by the way, I mean, before COVID, I used to drive around a lot. There's a whole issue about cognitive entrainment and patterns. If you hire a car in a right-hand drive country, I can drive without worrying about it. But if I take my car into France, it's actually dangerous. Yeah, that, that, that sort of change of the gear stick, well, yeah, or whatever, and, and the steering wheel is key, but that's a sidebar. So that's kind of like where things are clear. Um, there's an obvious relationship between cause and effect. In complicated, it's different. The relationship between cause and effect exists, but it's not self-evident. It has to be discovered. It may be self-evident to an expert. So you either have to trust the expert or you have to do analysis or you have to do research. 
So what we then got is clear, complicated, complex, chaotic. And then the central domain of Kinevian, which we're going to come to more at the end of this presentation, uh, which used to be called a disorder and is now called confused. Um, to be honest, this is a little bit of marketing. You know, we've now got five C's and it's complexity and it's Kinevian. There's lots of C's. You know, I can add in coherence and, and lots of other words. Complexity has a, a large sort of number of C words. So basically confused means I don't know which of the systems I'm in. And the danger with that is I will actually assume the system is the one I'm most comfortable with. So if I'm a bureaucrat, I'll assume that the problem is a failure of process. If I'm an expert, then, you know, it's just simply people didn't give me enough time or money to investigate this properly. Politicians are actually quite good at the complex domain. Um, if they have a problem they can't solve, they just pull lots of people in with lots of different ideas and listen to them all, which is actually quite a good strategy. And of course, fascists love a crisis because then they can be given absolute control to tell everybody else what to do. In fact, there's an old adage in this you know, in crisis management. If you have a good crisis manager, fire them because they probably created the crisis in the first place because they enjoy managing them too much. It's like, if you don't know it, the majority of cases of arson um, in bushfires are actually caused by firefighters. Uh, they actually like fires. So if you don't have enough naturally, they'll kind of like create them. Yeah. Um, so confused is about recognizing that there's a state of not knowing which system you're in. And as you say, when we come to a crisis, to move things from chaotic to confused makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you've got to stabilize things quickly. So that allows us to actually look at each domain now with a very different perspective. So in the clear domain, we can have best practice. Yeah, the constraints are fixed. There's one right yeah, where I'm doing things. If I'm in America, I drive on the right. If I'm in Britain, I drive on the left. If I'm in Southern Italy, it doesn't matter what side of the road I drive, um, provided I flock. It, it has actually been studied and the way to drive south of Naples is follow the next car, max speed, avoid collision. Yeah, if you do that, it's a stress-free driving experience. If you try and follow the rules, it won't work. But in the majority of countries, kind of like it's a simple classification system. So I sense, I categorize, I respond. Yeah, that's kind of like the sequence. In the complicated domain, on the other hand, um, Experts know, but I have to actually either trust the experts or do analysis. So I sense analyze respond. And now the constraints aren't fixed and rigid. They're called governing constraints. So they allow some degrees of freedom. And, and that's an important concept, yeah? Kind of like in a clear space, everything is tightly coupled. Now the coupling is becoming looser. Um, so for example, uh, uh, you know, you, you can get lots of differences. Right? So one of the things you find if you work with doctors, which I do a fair amount, is that different surgeons will have different views. Uh, when last December I was trepan, which was an interesting experience, having two holes, you know, drilled into your skull, it's given me huge street cred with the new age travellers around where I live at Avebury, but that's another matter. So it used to be associated with shamanistic practice. But when the surgeon discharged me, he said, oh, you had, you, he said, it was interesting. The surgeon who was going to operate on me wanted to put a, a, a tube into the head to allow them to check and drain later. But the surgeon who did operate me on me didn't do that. There were different practices and they had different reasons for doing it and different practices around that. And there's nothing wrong with that because if you have the right expertise, you're allowed to vary the practice. And a big mistake people do is to try and enforce best practice in a good practice domain. Right? So these, that's what we mean, the difference between fixed constraints is one way of doing things. Governing constraints, provided you satisfy the constraint condition, you can do things in different ways, best practice or good practice. Um, in the chaotic domain, I'm gonna leave complexity for last. If you're in here accidentally, as opposed to deliberately, we're going to come on to the deliberate moves in a minute, um, then basically you've got to act 
decisively to destroy the chaos. You've got to create some type of constraint. Yeah, there are no effective constraints here. It means that practice will always be novel. It's actually quite interesting. The old adage is there's nothing so good as a crisis to encourage innovation. Because what's happened in a crisis is the constraints have disappeared. So a lot of the entrained patterns, remember people don't see the gorilla? Yeah, in the x-rays, all of a sudden people are seeing things differently so you can get novelty. Yeah, so the model there is accents respond unless you go in there deliberately. And then in the complex domain, uh, this is the enabling constraints. The way I normally distinguish between governing constraints and enabling constraints is think about the difference between a rule and a heuristic. Yeah, so a rule says thou shalt. Yeah, a heuristic says something similar, but it's different. The best example I know is the US Marines. And I've done a lot of work down at Quantico over the years. And they have a simple set of heuristics. If the battlefield plan breaks down, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. Now that's called an enabling constraint. It doesn't tell you what to do, but whether you've complied with it is measurable. And I've done a lot of work with companies from Chanel to South African mining companies to identify the judgment heuristics which are embedded in their not normal stories codify them and then distribute them as a different control mechanism. Because the whole point about a complex world is you've got inherent ambiguity. Yeah, and you can't prescribe for ambiguity in advance. One of the things we'll talk about later on in this series is the question about distributions. And remember I said this last week, in complexity we're in the tail of a Pareto distribution, not in the center of a normal distribution. Yeah, which means the number of things we've got to take into account is just too high. Yeah, and therefore we've got to have some governing principles, but we can't pre-prescribe what we should do. And that's where constraints come into play. Uh, vastly underused in management and also generally in governance worldwide. But it's one of the important areas, yeah? A lot of work on heuristics, uh, especially linked with ritual. And practice here is exaptive. <clears throat> Now this is a phrase from biology. If you want a simple English phrase as an alternative, you can talk about radical repurposing. All right, so acceptation, I'll give you my favorite two biological examples. Uh, feathers evolved on dinosaurs for warmth or sexual display. We've now got the evidence from the discoveries in Northern China, uh, which actually say that all dinosaurs had feathers of some type. Yeah, some got lots of feathers, and those are the dinosaurs that fell off cliffs, yeah, or possibly ran at speed and took off and glided. Yeah, we, we can see those two pathways. What then happens is the feathers, which evolved, which adapted in a linear way for one purpose, under conditions of stress, except for something completely different. Now this was a key discovery in evolutionary biology. It's attributed to Gould and others, because until we had this, there wasn't enough time in human evolution for the brain to have developed the capacity it has. But to give you my other example, the cerebellum, the base of your brain, which evolved in higher apes to manipulate muscles in fingers, accepts in humans to control grammar in language. So the huge sophistication of language couldn't develop in a linear way, it's too big a leap. It required a non-linear acceptive change. Yeah, now actually we now know that most features of the human, of a human body happened accidentally, not by design. They evolved for one function, then we kind of like radically repurpose them for something else. And we do this all the time anyway. I have radically repurposed many things to open beer bottles in a bar late at night in a hotel without the proper instrument. I'm extremely good at that now. I've got lots of uh, models. And then in 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine notices that a chocolate bar melts in his pocket. Uh, now, he wasn't the first person to notice this. Most people swore and got their trousers cleaned but he realizes the significance, we get microwave ovens. Yeah, the magneto is repurposed. Right? 
Thalidomide was developed in the pharmaceutical industry for pain relief. It produced two, two side effects. One was a terrible one in deformed children. The other was the first ever cure for leprosy. Right? And that happened because people noticed the side effect. And of course, pharma has the most famous one of all in that somebody wrote, noticed a rather unusual side effect in a drug designed for heart disease, which had resulted in Viagra. So this ability, well, I call it small noticings. The ability to notice something which has new significance is key to what we call exaptive innovation rather than adaptive innovation. In a complex world, you've got every opportunity to repurpose quickly in order to get advantage. And when I talk about apex predator theory, I'm going to talk about the exaptive moment, the point at which you have to repurpose because you haven't got in time for, to invent from scratch. If you want a good example of this, remember that IBM repurposed their worldwide expertise in punch cards to get early dominance in computing. Yeah, generally, competitive advantage comes to the person who can repurpose existing competence for something new rather than the person who invents from scratch. So acceptation is key there. So that then kind of like starts to make the, the framework more sophisticated. But then in a key is it? I'm trying to get the screen to change, but it stopped changing. I'm doing my best here, guys, but everything is frozen. Ah, sorry to work. Now, this is a significant addition to Canavin. It's one more line. Um, and I'll say now that my view of sense making frameworks is there is a basic test. Can you draw them on the back of a table napkin from memory? If you can't do that, they have no utility. Yeah, they're kind of like, you know, you see these big consultancy models and dependency frameworks. And this came to me when I was in Naples with my daughter looking at Caravaggio's paintings. And if you know his paintings, you know they, they use colour and tone in quite brilliant ways. And that was when I suddenly realised what I've been looking for is the anthropological concept of liminality. So liminality is a state of transition or suspended transition. So if you go back to the original anthropology, when somebody puts on a mask yeah, in, in a ritual, they go through a liminal state of transition between being who they were and what the mask represents. Yeah. Now, before we had liminality, we had dynamics and arrows moving across Kenevin. And we actually found that people were very confused by that. They couldn't handle two classification systems, domains and dynamics. By adding liminality, we created the concept of transition. Yeah, and that, that was really important because it changes the way people think. So it gives us actually four liminal domains. One is the domain between complex and complicated. So in the complex environment, many hypotheses are equally valid. I mean, you've all been there if you've been a decision maker. 10 or 15 people come to you, they've all got perfectly coherent ideas. You can't decide who's right on the evidence base. Yeah, and you have to make a decision. That's actually a definition of a complex environment. Yeah, if the evidence supports conflicting hypotheses and you can't resolve them on an evidence basis within the time frame for the decision making, it's complex. It's a really simple way of thinking about it. So instead of deciding, what you actually do is you run a safe to fail experiment for each coherent hypothesis and you run them in parallel, not in sequence because you don't want no one want what's called a Hawthorne effect. Anything novel always works the first time for humans. It's a, it's a real problem with government initiatives, kind of like, you know, a prototype will always produce good results, but it won't necessarily scale. It comes from the Hawthorne experiments back in the 1920s. 
if you pay attention to people and do something new, it will nearly always work. And that actually is a real danger for people in terms of the way we do things. So basically in the complex world, you do multiple parallel safe to fail experiments and the experiments change the dynamics of what's going on so you can see what will work. If you've got it down to one or two options, then you move into the liminal domain. For anybody in Agile, this is where things like techniques like Scrum come into play. You've now limited the hypotheses and you just want to get the details right. You're going through iterative process, you're not yet firm. And you're trying to shift things into complicated. Because if you can shift things into complicated, you can scale at low cost. But there's quite high energy in doing that because that's an upwards move on the energy scale. So that's that liminal domain between complex and complicated. And of course, you may then decide not to shift it over. You may want to keep your options open. The liminal domain with chaotic is something I'll deal with next week in more detail. That's where you actually deliberately remove all connectivity in order to allow for novelty to emerge. It's kind of like an innovation space. Yet you break existing constraints so that the constraints no longer apply. We also use it for distributed decision support. This is the wisdom of crowds concept. If I have a thousand people looking at a situation and interpreted it in parallel without any connectivity, I've actually got a mathematical way of making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Yeah? Because if I remove all connections, I'm moving things to the center of a normal distribution, whereas if I have connections, things are in the tails of a Pareto distribution. I'll do more on that next week. But the, thing, the one I really love on Wisdom of Crowds is a US submarine which grounded off the post, coast of Portugal. Uh, it didn't sink. I was corrected on that by an admiral in Norfolk Navy Base. He pointed out submarines are meant to sink. And I kind of like learned from that not to argue with a four star, you know, accept the ritual of humiliation and get it out of the way because then they'll listen to you thereafter. So it grounded, right? They, nobody knew where it was. So they gave date, the, what data they had to multiple groups of experts around the world including some Nova Scotia fishermen, because they know about the Atlantic. Yeah? And all of them estimated where it was. None of them were remotely right, but a probability distribution of all the estimates was within 600 meters of the actual submarine. All right, now there are sound scientific and statistical reasons for this. And a large part of our work in a crisis is actually to move things into the space. It's also how we find the 17%. The 17% who've seen a gorilla and can't understand why other people haven't, going back to the first lecture. Okay? Now, the other two liminal domains I'm going to deal with in a minute um, because they're within confused. And that's kind of like probably I'm going to finish. So this is why you'll see, if you see Kinevin now, you'll see it's marked as AC. So this central domain of confused is actually a liminal domain. And confused now has two aspects. Being confused and not being aware of it actually puts you onto that catastrophic fold. It's a bad place. Yeah, the gray area is bad. The green, however, means you're aware you're confused so you can do something. And we're calling that apparatic. Yeah? Um, it goes back to a whole philosophical concept, the whole rhetorical concept. Um, it's the concept of creating paradoxes of ambiguity of unsolvable problems so that you think differently about things. Okay? So this is all about actually triggering a series of changes, the creation of aporia. Okay? Um, and I'm not really prepared to simplify that one. So that leads me on to crisis management. And with this, I'm going to you know, wind up and finish and open up for questions. So in a real crisis, you've got to, and let, I'm going to talk about this in the context of COVID because this is where I've been working for some time now. If you've got a major crisis, the most key thing you have to do is to do a draconian imposition of constraints to get you out of chaos. Uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister did this very well. Yeah, the US and the UK decided to wait to see if they really had to do a lockdown. She did a lockdown because it gave her more options. 
Yeah, the whole point about draconian constraint is to do things to give you options, whether they're right or wrong. Yeah, you want to open up the option space. And that effectively is a shift into apparatic. The move you never do is to apply existing best practice. That may well have got you there in the first place. It's tempting and people will be arguing for it, but you shouldn't do it. So that's your first stage. Yeah? This is all, as I say, about to be published in the EU handbook on how to manage in a crisis, which I'm writing and we're jointly producing between the Canavan Centre and the European Commission. Something which is rather ironic, given the stupidity of the English, right? We're blaming them entirely for Brexit. Right? Um, there are then other moves. So the second move is a very simple one. Um, you'll probably find out that a whole bunch of experts have been telling you what was going to go wrong and you haven't been listening to them. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you're a senior decision maker, because the number of people who are trying to tell you what you're doing wrong is huge and legion. And who you pay attention to is another matter. But now you kind of like know who you should. So, for example, many governments haven't been paying attention to epidemiologists. So if you have this problem, you invite the experts in, you apologize humbly, you give them resource and you do what you're told. That's one shift. Then a whole body of problems will be long there. But you may also have this really interesting area, which is a liminal domain within complicated, the one with the question mark in it. That's where you've got experts who can't agree. So we had that in Britain with a massive fight between epidemiologists and behavioral economists. Right? Now that's where you have competing expertise and there's a whole body of techniques we've developed. I blogged about one of those today, if anybody wants to read up on it, called a trioptican which is a highly ritualized encounter between three experts with multiple participants. So it's ritualized, it's short term, it's not designed to have people lobbying you, it's designed to ritualize that process of conflict so you can decide where things go. So that's movement number three. We then get the other two moves. Movement number four is you kind of like have a whole series of hypotheses about what you should do and you think you've covered them all off, right? Then you set up the safe to fail experiments. Small amount of money to each different idea. We've been doing that with actually developing a vaccine. There are many different approaches to that, so we're given different options here. Yeah? If you're not sure that you know what all the hypotheses are, then you move into that liminal domain with chaos, because you know out there there are things or ideas, the 17% that you need to pay attention to. Now, the key thing to decide on this is, do you go clockwise or anti-clockwise? Yeah, and the higher level of uncertainty, there's a trigger point where you go, anti, you go clockwise, not anti-clockwise. Yeah, you start in that liminal domain with chaos, but that's going to create a lot more uncertainty. So you don't want to do it unless you've got to. It's much easier to go anti-clockwise as you move around that. Yeah. So that basically is Kinevin. Yeah. Um, I just thought I'd show this so you understand some of the differences. And also showing the Zimmerman framework and the Stacy framework. Yeah, they're based on human perception, all right, and actually balancing human perception off. Kinevin is based on actual ontology, the nature of systems. It, it, it's a fundamental divide. And Ralph and I have argued about that from time to time. And Barbara and I did when she was alive. Yeah? So you may see other uses of the language, but they're actually different. Okay, that's one of my cats. Yeah, that, that's going to be an introduction to next week's lecture. Um, that was when it was a kitten and the first time it went out into the garden, the bird died shortly afterwards, it's a killer. Yeah. Um, so that will introduce apex predators next week. But that was kind of like a summary of Kinevin, a specific set of action about uh, applications. Um, if you actually search for Kinevin, um, you'll find it's been used. I mean, if you, on Google Scholar, the, the use is a legion. I published a, a brilliant little video recently from a group in um, Finland. Um, who actually used it to understand deprived children in Helsinki and, and lack of social housing. 
Um, it's taught in, you don't get to command level in any of the American military services without being taught kinetic. All right, so the whole thing has kind of like just taken off in the ways that I didn't expect. One of the things I'm proud of is people can use it at different levels. It's fractal. People can look at it, understand it, and use it without training, but then they go deeper and deeper, and every time you go deeper, you find something else. And the reason for that is theory has co-evolved with practice. It wasn't a one-time production. Yeah. As I talk with people, the thing developed, additional things get added. It's probably in near finished state at the moment. Right? And I'm not sure we can do much more with it. Um, but I've said that before and lived to regret it. So I'm not making a firm commitment. Yeah? So that's a fundamental. And the, another phrase for this is multi-ontology sense-making. One of the big drivers for Kinevin was I got fed up of management fads. Yeah, so we do something which made a difference and then it would stop making a difference. So we abandon it and start again. And I kept saying, but it worked. We just took it beyond its limitations. There was nothing wrong with business process re-engineering applied to core manufacturing. But then people tried to apply it to customer service and it broke. So this is a concept called bounded applicability. First work out the ontology and then the epistemology follows. And actually, one of the great things about complexity, if you're a philosopher, is it allows contradictory ontological states to coexist. And that resolves a lot of problems in philosophy, but also a lot of problems in business. It's a both and sense making framework, not a either or sense making framework. OK, um, I've done the 40 minutes. So now we've got 20 minutes for questions and I'm open. Um, looking at yeah. the, uh, yeah, thanks Dave. That was, that was uh, great. This is also a gin and tonic just to confess. Well. Uh, thank you, Dave. That was, that was great. Um, maybe I should just follow up with one of my questions, give everyone a chance to put their questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, I never saw this, this version of, um, Kinevin with the dimension of liminality in it. And I was wondering, you talked a bit about the evolution of, of the framework. I'm wondering how this specific aspect, how do you, how do you come up with it? And um, what was the experience like uh, realizing or coming up with it? And I, well, I've just written 12,000 words on the history of Kinevin, which is actually a complex metaphor with Lord of the Rings. And, and, and there's going to be a prize to the first person who can work out what I'm referring to when I talk about Peter Jackson's total corruption of Faramir. Sorry, I'm and that generation, he destroys Faramir. Yeah. Um, and it was actually quite interesting. I, I was looking at the different things which contributed to it and actually art was significant and that was significant in liminality. And you remember I said last week, one of the functions of art in evolutionary history is to allow abstraction so you make novel connections. Yeah. So I had a problem, which is people didn't understand dynamics. So we had lots of different colored arrows moving between domains and people didn't get that. So they kept using it as a static categorization framework. Yeah, they, they'd often draw it as a two by two and put a token circle in the middle to stop me attacking them. Yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah, though I've been fairly tolerant over the years. And as I say, I was, you know, in Naples with my daughter. Um, working with her on her anthropology thesis. So we had a father-daughter trip to Naples to study graffiti. If you want to study graffiti, Naples is a great place. The fact that we coincidentally went to a few other places like good restaurants and Herculean was irrelevant, right? Um, father-daughter trips were a lot of fun. Um, and we both love Caravaggio and we were both looking at the paintings in Naples and then that contrast of light and shade yeah, and the way in which, you know, he also uses common people to, to represent complex ideas or represent the idea of grace. You know, the whole point about those paintings is they're in a constant state of transition. And that was what triggered the liminality discussion. And if your daughter is an anthropologist, if you say, is it liminal, then you then listen to a four hour lecture on liminality. Yeah, and then it all came from there. So. That was actually how it came about. It was a, a problem 
which in the right context had a solution presented. Oh yeah, that's excellent. Um, so yeah, so I've seen some questions in the in the chat. So uh, I believe Peter Snowden had a question about exaptation and play. Peter, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, it's just a very small point, but um, I remember reading um, about the role that play and non-purposive activity played according to some um, archaeologists and anthropologists in the development of, for instance, tools for human use and so yeah. that it's sort of central function. I'm just wondering how that plays with the more, I don't know, biological, zoological concepts of evolution. I think it does. I think, you know, play, I mean, art, art and music can be for language in human evolution. Yeah, and that's significant and play obviously does as well. And I think what all of them allow us to do is to separate ourselves, our set, they, they remove us from reality so we can see it from a different perspective. Uh, that, that's the value. And, and although it developed as something primitive, it then evolves as something very sophisticated because of its utility. Yeah? Um, it's why actually um, STEM education is plain bloody dangerous for the species. Yeah, because we're focusing on STEM education and actually from a species point of view, particularly with climate change and everything else, we need some more generalists and we need people you know, have that ability to play, to actually see things in art, to see things differently. I get some of my best ideas at the opera, yeah, particularly Wagner, because Wagner is transcendental. So you go to another place, all right, in, in terms of the way it works. Um, and we know that ritual is important for humans because ritual allows us to change we, we view, we, the way we view the world. So the plus side for human beings is we've evolved to very, in very sophisticated ways to separate ourselves from reality. The plus point is that makes us hugely inventive. The downside is it makes us highly vulnerable to conspiracy theories. Yeah. And Peter, if you don't know, we're probably within three degrees of separation as relatives. Because that the name the name in both spelling comes from one small village in Northumberland, and they only left it about three generations ago. So, so you know that, gosh! I, all, all, all Snowdens are very closely related. We can't escape it, including yeah. the police chief of Los Angeles. But he was an ex-slavery name, so he doesn't count. Okay, my family are still close to the source then, because they're up on Tyneside. Yeah. Ah, well, there you are. That's interesting. Um, Richard, Richard, Richard has... Yalis, Anita, all right. Thank, thank you, Khalil. Dave, it's an honor to, uh, to be able to speak with you directly. I've been following you for years. In defining confused early on, which is a beautiful new term, you spoke about moving from chaotic to confused. And in my history of studying you, you've in the past spoken about moving from chaotic directly to complex. And so my question is, in, is, this a, is this part of something that you've changed as you've moved, as you've added the concept of liminality to the model? Yeah, and I think I mean, it's, it's always dangerous on this. I turned up at Auckland University once to give a lecture on Kinevin and discovered it was a master's class, all of whom were writing theses on Kinevin and thought, and it gave me all these references they thought I'd read. And I was sitting there saying, I haven't read it. I haven't read it, honestly. Yeah, but um, yeah, so that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, I used to say there were two exits from, from chaos. One was to move to complex. The other was to move to, sim to what was then simple. And the idea is complex is safer because you can experiment. We're now actually, I've now changed that and said it's better to move to confuse. Yeah, because that concept of aporia gives you more options. So yeah, that is a change. Yeah. And I don't think I was wrong before, but I wasn't right. That's a very Dave Snowden specific answer. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Yeah. And he's having hysterics in the background there, I can see him. <laughs> yeah, so we have a lot of good questions coming up. Dave, are you able to save a bit maybe a bit fifteen minutes after the hour? Yeah, no problem. 
Okay, great. Yeah, gin, gin and tonic has got an inch left. That's fine. Perfect. Excellent. So, uh, Anjan, I believe you had a question. Would you like to ask? Um, what are some popular books you absolutely despise? Uh, good books. Anything books. which says the seven something or other. Or, yeah, anything like that. Yeah. I mean, simplistic recipes. I mean, I'll tell you a story here. I was, Mary Boone and I were having a phone call um, with a book agent because we are going to write the book. Yeah, and I'm writing it with Mary because it was good writing a Harvard article with her. And she knows Don Tapstock, and I don't like Don Tapstock very much, but she does. But either way, he gave us a, a book agent. So we found out the book agent, go through the book plan, and he says, no, not interested. And we said, why? He said, too difficult, too complicated. What I need from you is five books, not one book. And we said, what do you mean? And he said, you need to understand the way this works. What I want is a book with a catchy title, with one idea, with lots of cases. And I want one of those every 18 months to two years and we'll make our money on the speaker fees. And I thought, now I understand Steve Denning, Nicholas Taleb, all of these people, that's what they're caught into, right? And the idea of creating something which is a contribution to the field is contrary. Because he actually said that. And he said, no, 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 you must claim originality. It's got to be completely new. Yeah, and I mean, that's the problem I got with Taleb and anti-fragility. I mean, the idea has been around for ages. He didn't bloody well invent it. Yeah. So I think those sort of simplistic books are problematic. Yeah. And the other problem is the confusion of correlation with causation, which is endemic. So you've got people who will study 10 companies, draw conclusions and think they can trust in that. And sorry, my background is in physics. Yeah, no social scientist ever has enough data to form any valid conclusion whatsoever, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and now you've got the more recent ones. I mean, it's like, um, well, one, one of the books I really despise is Reinventing the Organization by Francis Le Crooks because that's a guy who's got a religious hypothesis about how things should be. And he only selects aspects of his cases to support the hypothesis. And that's becoming increasingly common. Yeah, the, the, the use of partial aspects of cases and inadequate investigation to find it. Uh, another one, sorry, you got me onto a favorite subject and I'm in a polemical mood at the moment. Um, another one is the concept of what's it called? Um, the book about, oh God, it's a really popular one. I forgot the name of it. It's about startup companies. So it basically says you need to pivot and all that sort of thing. What's it called now? Anybody remember? Lean Startup. Lean Startup. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's it. Right? Now, I looked at that. Right? This is a guy and went, who went to interview friends of his who succeeded. Right? That's a really bad sampling technique. And he identifies things they did in common and then says, if you do these things, you will be successful. Well, I remember when I was in IBM's research group, we did a project with Dorothy Leonard of Harvard, who's a serious academic. And we studied companies which had succeeded and companies who failed in Silicon Valley. We actually studied the ones who failed as well as the ones who succeeded. And we find they all did all the same things. There was no difference. Yeah, the point is you had a market with enough players that some are bound to succeed. All right, so those I often use in lectures as examples. We, we have got a very trivial attitude to book publishing at the moment, which is based on satisfying a need for simplistic recipes and easy answers. And the problem as well is our bloody politics is confounded by that as well. But, uh, Yeah, thanks for that bit of guidance. Uh, we have a question here with two plus one, so I'm going to ask it. Um, ask the person to ask a question. Uh, our beloved Benita Roy, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Benita. You're on mute. I mean, I, I, I wish I could say I could do this anytime, but you are currently on mute. Hold on. 
Uh, I love the new Kinevin, and I've seen the uh, illustrations around, but uh, having you present it was really cool. Okay, so this is kind of a, a little bit off topic, okay. kind of hypothetical, you know me. Um, you know, the subtext in a lot of this work is that the world just gets more and 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 more, and more complex and more chaotic maybe. And I'm wondering if you have a story about the future in your mind where there's some kind of bifurcation event in which the ontology returns to simpler best practice dynamics due to you know, some kind of integration of the human mind or new realities along the lines of, you know, people talk about the release after the release phase of panarchy. Do you see like just this simple growing complexity or do you see the, the potential of some kind of catastrophic but advantageous bifurcation event. So, so not the extinction event after which the cockroaches rule, right? Because no, no, that's no, no. Actually a likely one. This is somewhat. Um, yeah, no, not that. I, I think there's a danger in this. All right, in that I mean, uh, and I, I say this as a as a good Catholic and somebody who's just starting a major project to understand the numinous in society, but there is a huge danger of us getting mystical about all of this stuff yeah and assuming that somehow or other there will be some major phase shift and you can see this in two ways you can see it in the the total nonsense of the idea that we can put a human brain into a computer yeah if if you believe that it may be possible for you because your brain is now ossified to the point where it's it's achievable right um, there's as much biology in this as anything else. I think the other one is a sort of Ken Wilber integral nonsense, yeah? And the concept of higher states of being in transition between it. I mean, the basic fact is we are constantly evolving and changing and we are losing and gaining capacity. Um, we could lose intelligence as well as gain it, right? Um, and I actually think that the problem at the moment is connectivity and consequences, not complexity. So the world has always been complex, but the problem is it's now so tightly connected and the consequences of mistakes are so high that we're at much higher risk. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering the question really, but I wouldn't predicate action on that as hope. Um, Terry Eagleton, um, if you haven't read Terry Eagleton, he's hugely prolific. There isn't a single book of his which isn't worth reading. Um, his latest is called Radical Sacrifice. Yeah? Um, but he's also got one which is looking at hope. Yeah? And I can't remember, hang on, two seconds, I'll get it. Um, It's called hope, hope without optimism. Yeah. Now, that's, a, I mean, Terry and I were both editors of Slant, the Catholic Marxist journal back in the 70s. He comes from that background. And both of us read Maltman. If you haven't read Theology of Hope, that's worth reading. Yeah. And I think one of the big things we've got to start to introduce into sense making is this concept of hope without optimism. Yeah. Because the danger is if you have hope with optimism, which is the Wilbur problem, you end up withdrawing from the world. You've now got the perfect excuse to withdraw from action. Mm -hmm. So so that would be a, but you and I have talked about this every now and then. I was trying to find the bloody scapula you gave me, but I can't find it now, it's there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting hypothetical. I mean, I, I agree with you. We have to live in the world that we have and not, uh, in the world that we think is coming or some hy hypothesized, but yeah, thank you. This notion of decoupling, uh, loose, loose coupled connectivity, but looser coupling, I know you've talked about it, that I think is the move we're looking for. Yeah, the other thing which is worth reading at the moment is this one. Yeah. Donna, because that, that, that's kind of like going beyond the Anthropocene. Um, and David, David is really good on the Anthropocene as well. So that there are some serious academic texts on looking at this you yeah. know, concept of theological shift. Uh, yeah. Stephanie Wakefield also. I, there's a group of what I call post-anthropic thinkers that yeah. are, I, I would say they're, they're able to really uh, 
be patient in the liminal spaces that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and you, you get it in sand talk. I mean, remember I spent a lot of the 70s in Kakadu in northern Australia, yeah, working with a, a, a indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And that was hugely educational. Actually, a lot of the techniques like ritual descent came from that. What's fascinating in indigenous communities is all this bloody nonsense about everybody being nice to each other doesn't yeah. apply. <laughs> Not yeah, it's kind of like, you know, the, you know, the reality of, of the Neolithic lifestyle requires something a little bit more sensible than that. If you haven't seen it, Ten Canoes is a brilliant film as well. Yeah, and Young Kaporka was on the store and he was talking about people torturing each other or, or something, yeah. or, you know, kind of giving that flavor uh, of tribal society. Punishing, that's what he was saying. Anyway, thank you very much. It was a great exchange. Uh, I would love to hear Dave talk about uh, these religious topics more sometime with hope and sacrifice. Um, but yeah, we have a question by Dan Feldman. Dan, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Let, can you can you copy it down in the bottom again for me? I believe it was. Um, it's nice to nice to talk to you, Dave. I've been uh, reading your stuff for quite a while. Um, my question is, what is uh, a multi-ontology sense-making way to translate what is typically called the problem and solution in the ordered space? How would you translate problem and solution into the other, into the other domains? That language, okay. I guess. I, I may or may not have understood the question, but let me try some answers, all right? Okay. One of the ways that we work, I mean, first of all, and we'll do this next week when I do apex predator theory, complexity is taking off at the moment. And I remember when systems thinking went from academic idea to dominant concept and it took about three to four years. Yeah, so it's actually very fast when it happens. It's a phase shift, it's not a gradual shift. And we're seeing that with complexity, which worries some of us because the wrong type of complexity thinker could come out on top. Yeah, and and that's why I and others make quite rigid distinctions between systems thinking and complexity thinking, because we don't want confusion between the two. No, we, we can go into that later. Yeah? So one of the ways that certainly I've introduced it over the years is to find intractable problems. Don't go for the low hanging fruit. Yeah, governments and industry and the higher up you get, the more they get complexity. You don't get to be on the board of a major international company without understanding that there's a lot of stuff you can never know. Yeah, and that, yeah, I mean, one of the other frameworks I developed back in 1980 was an uncertainty matrix which compared known unknowns and unknowables. All right, um, and that was an ontology epistemology framing. And I remember presenting that in the Pentagon once a few years ago at the request of John Poindexter. And after that, I couldn't use it again for about four or five years because it got tainted. Yeah, but yeah, I, I still use that with executives. So if you've got unknowable unknowns, you can't apply conventional wisdom. The other one, which is really scary for executives, is unknown knowns. So that's where people in your organization know what to do, but you don't know that they know it. Yeah. So you start to focus them on those and then they're prepared to use complexity methods. Right? The other thing is tools are important. I mean, one of the reasons we developed SenseMaker, apart from it being counterterrorism, was the ability to demonstrate something like, if we do this, you can see this, look at that picture, what do you think it means? Is that's one of the other ways you make it tangible for people. Now, I may not have answered the question you asked. I answered the question I heard. So uh, that's always a danger. Well, it's just, it, I, I guess it's the use of the word solution. A lot of people, you know, they define whatever the problem is, whether it's a complicated problem or usually it's a, if it's a social problem, uh, most of the time it's in the complex space from my assessment. And it tends to be, uh, this is the problem that has multiple complex right, entangled right. roots and here's our solution. And right. somehow well, that, 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 that I, I cringe but, when I hear that term. But there are parts of it that, that you can do. I mean, there are three basic principles of complexity management, all right? So one is 
optimize the granularity of what you're dealing with, which generally means smaller things. The other is distribute and diversify cognition. And the third is disintermediate decision makers. If you follow those three, you can't go far wrong. And people keep talking about a system as being complex or complicated when actually aspects of it are complex and aspects of it are complicated. So one of the things Kinevin is designed to do is to find the things which aren't complex, which you know what to do about. And also to find the things in the complex domain, and I can do this next week if people remind me, because one of the key things we do with executives is constraint mapping because constraints are ordered aspects of a complex system. So one of the ways you can change things is to change the constraints. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, Peter Lindbergh, your question had a one plus, so I'm gonna let you ask your question. Cool, all right. So uh, the question is, uh, any good examples, current or past, of political and or social movements consciously imposing states of liminality between the ontological domains in order to enact change oh, interesting. and the uh, temporary autonomous zone by the, that anarchist uh, Hakim Bey comes to mind? Uh, yeah, you, you, you shouldn't talk to a former Catholic Marxist-Leninist about our anarchists. Yeah? You know, we, we can have two methods to deal with them. One involves pickaxes and the other involves alter the phase, right? Um, and anarchism always gives way to fascism, by the way. Yeah? Um, I think there are liminal states. I mean, you could argue the Mensheviks were a liminal state in the Russian Revolution. I'm, I'm thinking aloud here, right? Um, I don't think, I think the problem with anarchism is it's too informed by libertarian concepts of identity. So it over focuses on the individual. And when we talked about this last time, the difference between social atomism and communitarianism. And um, I think if you get communitarianism, you get the fact that our identities are collective, not individual, then there are multiple states of liminality that could exist, right? Um, we're doing some work at the moment, which if anybody's interested in, I'm happy to talk to more people about, on the whole issue about citizen juries and citizen assemblies. And we're looking at ways, and we're doing some of this with Extinction Rebellion, which hopes, uh, the, the side of me which quite fancy is the U UK Prime Minister making me a terrorist again. I've always wanted to be a terrorist. Um, sorry, the UK Prime Minister is planning to ban, ban climate change activists as terrorists. It's ridiculous, right? So we're doing some work with them at the moment on um, actually using mass engagement to inform citizen assemblies. Because one of the things we've got to start doing is rethinking democracy, because democracy wasn't designed to work with populations of the size we've got, with the long-term consequences of a short-term decision focus. All right, so the current political system is not only broken, it's potentially gonna kill us, All right? So that's one of the areas we're working. And that is actually about creating liminality of decisions to allow new, new solutions to emerge, All right? Now that's something which doesn't happen in a two-party state or a one-person, one-vote state where people are effectively yeah, abbreviating their ideas. It doesn't work either if you delegate your ideas electronically. That's a cute idea, but that won't work either. So I think uh, one of the things we're, a lot of us are trying to do is to create more liminality. Yeah, because liminality keeps options open for longer. That's great. Um, we're kind of running out of time, so maybe we can have one or two more questions. We'll see. Um, Jeff, Jeff Irving, would you like to ask your question? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I won't try to reread what I, what I wrote. What was on my mind was whether, if you could speak to how people's uh, default preference of how they see themselves operating within a preferred domain. So, uh, hi, I'm Jeff. I think of myself as particularly suited to making sense of the world from the complex domain. 
interferes with how I could effectively leverage Kinevin? I think, I mean, two things on this. I, I don't want to go down a Myers-Briggs route. Um, I mean, that, that's one of the worst pseudosciences around at the moment. And people who put their Myers-Briggs scores on their business card need therapy fast, in my view, right? Um, reality is most of us are capable of operating in all domains very quickly. In fact, we always do it. I mean, the one, I mean, the children's party story, which you can look up online, which is the best teaching story I've ever created. Yeah, fundamentally makes the point that we manage our children on the assumption they're a complex adaptive system. So we know how to do it. Yeah in terms of the way we, way we do things. So all of that's available. We do to have done some interesting projects. One of the things I did in Singapore, and Singapore funded a lot of the experimentation on this, is we actually created the Kinevian framework with six ministries and they worked in cross ministry teams. So we created it with lots of exemplar narratives to define the domains and the boundary spaces. And we sent them away for two weeks and we brought them back and put them into ministry teams. And we gave them all of the exemplars, but without the way they were positioned and asked them to create the Canavian framework for it. And they created six completely different versions, even though they'd all worked together before. Yeah, so what you actually found is the foreign office put everything, every, everything was simple or clear because they just wrote reports after the event. Uh, Ministry of Defence, I was quite proud of, but there again, I was an advisor and I'd been training them for five years. They, they kept near the same distribution. Yeah? Um, the Home Office put everything into complicated. If you think about it, well, they're evidence-based, they're police. Yeah? So that was fascinating because we then put the, we created the charts and said, well, we see it like this, you see it like that. There's nothing wrong with that, but we need to realise there's a miscommunication there. Yeah? And that's something called descriptive self-awareness. One of the things we do a lot, I mean, the famous case on this is the SenseMaker one, where we were working on the um, aroma problem within Europe. So we got Roma kids to act as ethnographers to Roma people in Hungary, and they got access to data nobody had ever got before. Yeah, no external research would get that. And then we took clusters of narrative, which had been indexed the same way by Roma people, and we gave it to the European Union anthropologists in Vienna and said, interpret this the way you think Roma interpreted it. And then we showed them the difference and the difference was huge. Okay? This happens a lot, right? And th there are three responses to this. One response is to say, oh my God, we should see it the same way they do. And that's just ridiculous. Yeah, you can't do it. You're an expert. You can't see things the same way. Alicia Gerardo calls this a gradient. There's a difference between you. The difference is actually quite creative if you accept it. Yeah? Um, so the right one is to say that, right? The really bad one is what we got from the anthropologists in Vienna was they don't understand their own stories. We're the experts. We understand what they really mean. And that is ever so common in what we call distributed ethnography. The expert can't cope with being shown the difference. So a lot of the work you do around complexity is to constantly throw people into positions where they can't challenge the process. All right? If you come in as an expert, they can challenge your expertise or they can challenge the process. If you take them through a process and they can't challenge it and they can see that as a result of the process, they saw it like this and you saw it like that, then you have a chance to change. And that's one of the ways Kinevin is used in practice. So yeah, I think I'm afraid we have to end there. I apologize to everyone else who had questions. Uh, this is part two of four. So there'll be two more um, sessions with Dave in this series. Uh, that was rich and engaging as usual. Dave, thanks again. Pleasure. And I'm just gonna pass it over to Peter to close up the session. Great, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, any, any kind of um, advanced preview for uh, next week? what we're going to talk about next week i'm going to look at apex predator theory um and the issue about when can you change things right? and when can't you change things in the nature of change very cool uh so i'll send you this uh i'll post this up probably today uh or tomorrow and you can um you can actually download the chat directly right now i believe if not i will send it to you uh, via email again 
uh, upcoming events at the STOA. Uh, tonight we have uh, Joe Norman uh, talking about applied complexity. That's at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, we have a series of sense makers and residents here. Uh, Peter Wang is one of them. And he's gonna talk about the mental models he uses to navigate all the complexity of this world. And that's uh, tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And Benita Roy has a sense maker in residence series coming in October. Uh, Benita, can I uh, take you and put you on the spot uh, and you maybe can plug it a bit? Yeah, so it's called The Hollow. Um, so it resonates with Halloween and a hollow is like a riverine kind of landscape where people used to meet uh, to conspire to throw over the government. And it also resonates with Dogen's notion of um, hollow bones and hollow bone zen. Um, it's a little bit of a, um, yeah, it's a, I think that um, it'll be interesting uh, series. Thank you, uh, Benita. Uh, and you can RSVP on the, the website, the store.ca, sign up for the mailing list. And if you like these events and want more of these events, um, you can support us on the Patreon. Uh, that's at uh, the Stoa uh, Patreon. So yeah, thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. See you next week. Mwah.